And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple. Coming to us straight from Silent Mayhem Productions, and the, cre the creator of, min of many comics within the Hellbringers universe. The one, and the man who, well the worst thing I can say about him is, be is being a Red Sox fan. <laughs> the one and only Mark May. How you doing tonight, man? Or, tonight. I'm doing good, man. How are you? I'm, do I'm doing good. Um, I've... Having to juggle newfangled time zones is an interesting experience, especially with that whole thing of Australia deciding to take their central time zone and split it into two 30-minute time zones. For reasons yeah. for reasons I will not yeah. understand. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, time zones really don't matter anyways, because it's all made up, you know what I mean? <sighs> as much as I'd like to say that, it's one, it's one of those things I have to be anal about when setting up interviews. Because it, because not everywhere is it going to be ten thirteen. <laughs> That's a good point. Especially especially when the especially when it comes to dealing with international folk, where what might be an evening for me is the ass end of the morning for them. That's a good point. Oh, um, I had actually considered buying like it buying a dozen cheap clocks and set and setting them up for time zones the way they do in a news station or a, or a um, stock exchange. I mean, it would look cool, <laughs> for oh. sure. Well, I'd also have to I'd also have to commission a bunch of plates so that so I can list off the sit the city, in each one. You know, one one for Chicago, one for one for New York, one for Sao Paulo, one for London, and so on and so forth. Heck yeah, man! Oh, um, but I'd like to start at the humble beginnings, in a sense. Um. How did you, how did you first get into comics, and then walk me through the events that led to you starting to write your own? Well, um, I first got into comics back when I was a little kid. Uh, there was a comic shop out in Alabama that was about forty five minutes away, mm -hmm. and I always drove uh, out there with my parents and my grandparents, maybe once or twice a year, and I was able to get like maybe two or three books. I remember I'd always gravitate towards the uh, the 80s Amazing Spider-Man books, the ones that had like Hobgoblin and Kingpin. Uh, that that War of the Roses uh, story was always on the shelves back then. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I read a lot of that. And, you know, Jim Lee's X-Men and the cartoons really got me in it because uh, being 35 years old, I was a 90s kid. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, I was like five or six when those uh, X-Men and Spider-Man cartoons started coming out. So I became a huge fan, started collecting Fleer Marvel cards, uh, Upper Deck Marvel cards mm -hmm. from back in the day. And uh, me and my friends started trading them and stuff like that. And I started reading comics and started really enjoying it. And um, I, I kind of got out of it for a little while uh, in high school in my 20s because I was really busy and I just didn't have a chance. Uh, to pick up any of the stuff going on in the 2000s and 2010s. And then uh, about, I think it was 2009, 2010, I started getting into painting. And I uh, actually had some time to start reading comics again. Mm -hmm. And uh, I picked up, I think it was Saga, and started reading the run on Saga and Walking Dead and started reading a bunch of new indie books that were coming out and some of the Xenoscope stuff and seeing these amazing covers by, like, Mike DeBolfo and... Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, uh, Eric Basalda, all these different guys. Uh, and it just really, it kind of gave me inspiration to get into comic art. So I started drawing and, um, I was working a night shift, uh, in a hospital and it was boring. I was the only one in there and I had to walk around and do rounds and stuff. But in between the rounds, you had to find something to do. And I had already watched everything you could possibly watch on Netflix and I was like, man, what should I do? And I started, uh, I was like, well, you know, I started drawing. Uh, mm -hmm. I was getting kind of, I was getting kind of tired of my life, man. Like I was getting, I was getting, uh, I was getting, I don't know, like to the point to where I was like, man, I was down. That's, that's the best way to put it. I was mm -hmm. just, 
I didn't think I was going to live much longer. So I was like, you know, if I, if I'm going to die, what's the one thing I'm going to do before I go out? Well, I'm going to try the one thing I was ever good at and that's drawing. And uh, within a month of drawing, I had already sold my first piece. And then after I sold my first piece, uh, I was off to the races. Like two months later, I was in my first convention. Mm-hmm. And then the same year, I actually got to do a, a really big convention called Denver Comic Con out here in Denver. Mm-hmm. And um, that that con kind of pushed me uh, to different levels that I didn't think I was ever going to be at. And I ended up having a, a portfolio review with Neil Adams. Three months into drawing, ladies and gentlemen. Mm-hmm. And um, Neil kind of lit a fire under my ass that hasn't been put out. Uh, the entire time I've been in this industry and I really thank him for that because I've been, uh, I've been really, uh, productive since then is the best way to put it. I've gotten better at art, mm-hmm. done things that I didn't think I could do. And then, um, all of a sudden, uh, about, you know, I think it was, well, in 2015, we had the art of Mark May volume one come mm-hmm. out and it had a, uh, five page story in it called Hellbringer Zero. And Hellbringer Zero was the first appearance of Hellbringers, first appearance of Lilith, first appearance of Beelzebub. Uh, it, it had a first, a few first appearances in it. And I remember, uh, well, that was the first cameo, really. But mm-hmm. I remember, um, I mean, you know, that was six, let's see, at the time, that was six years ago, you know. Like, we, we didn't put a book out again until 2020, August of 2020, with the help of Chad Harden. Uh, who uh, licensed out the uh, product to make Hellbringers the Sacred Heart with me. And then I was off to the races after that by myself with Jengar mm-hmm. and Shred, Hellbringers Down of the Devil, Hellpug and Velocicock, and then our last one, Hellbringers the Ties That Bind Us. Mm-hmm. And I, I created Hellbringers with the intent of it being a card game and a comic someday. And we got the card game all the way up to set three out of four so far. We've only got... Uh, one more set to go with uh, 50 more characters, and then that'll be done. Uh, so all our Hellbringers universe will be ready to go and out there. But the cool thing is, is um, with this trade paperback that's coming out right now, that's uh, out, is it collects the first five issues uh, that we have in there. And potentially, um, I, I just, I think we'll be able to do another one. I think we'll, in about a year, we'll be able to have another trade paperback out. If we continue at the pace we're going right now, we should have five books out by the end of the year next year, no problem again, uh, especially with the incredible talent that we have working with us, like Joseph Michael Linsner, Shannon Mayer, Lucio Perillo, just guys you wouldn't believe in the industry that have come together to help make this indie comic uh, successful and uh, just a product that people want. It's it's an incredible feeling, man. Mm-hmm. It really is. Now... With the, with that in mind, walk me through the er, the early um, concepting of Hellbringer since that that's been the bulk, that's been the bulk of your work and I, there's sure. a f- to kind of to kind of open that up there's a few um there's a few names that I that I'd like to br- that I'd like to bring up and and ask if the ask if any of these were major or minor influences um I'll start with the only non-comic entry that I ha- that I have on this list and that is the legacy of Cain. The legacy of Cain. Mhm. Like Cain and Abel, is that what we're talking about? Um here? no, we're th- no as far as the as far as the games as far as the game series Blood Omen, Soul Reaver, Defiance, that thing, that theory, that particular thing. So you're not going to believe this, but I actually never played it. I um I I can I actually can believe it because I because I've had a lot of ex- I've been able to have a lot of experiences on this podcast. <laughs> so, I've like I said, I figured that was going to be a long ball so I'd get that out of the way early, but um there are t- there's there's a couple when it comes to comics that I that I can play a bit that I can play a bit of lightning round with. The one of the big ones I want to bring up is Spawn. Spawn was a major influence for me, uh, not only as a kid uh, growing up uh, reading comics. Uh, 1992, I believe, is when Spawn 1 came out. And, mm-hmm. you know, the whole story of the Image guys, not only Tom McFarlane, but Eric Larson, Rob Liefeld, 
uh, you know, Jim Valentino, all the guys that left Marvel or DC and went to go make that Jim Lee. Uh, I mean, here's the thing when it comes to image, I respect the hell out of those guys, but the spawn book itself is the book when I was a little kid and not only uh book, but I watched the TV series uh, mm-hmm. on HBO when I wasn't supposed to as a kid. <laughs> And uh, that that right there alone in itself uh, got me in a lot of trouble. But I was I was extremely influenced by Spawn. Todd McFarlane once said, uh, and I believe this is the most accurate and coolest thing you can do in comics is you take uh, somebody else's idea that you really love uh, and you try to make it better. Mm -hmm. And. And I've taken several ideas from different uh, creators that I respected and uh, read their books when I was growing up. And I know it's influenced me for Hellbringers. And the reason for that is I wouldn't have uh, a lot of the ideas floating in my head. I think a lot of the times uh, if they weren't planted there from somewhere before. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that somewhere before is definitely uh, Spawn has a lot to do with it. Um, We uh, we don't play into the realm and worlds that spawn do mm-hmm. and we don't come into earth uh like he does as much and you know he's got he's kind of got like a, a power meter that he's running out on mm-hmm. and we don't have we don't have that right now uh attila who basically has uh, the sacred heart right now his power meter is only going to go up with all the evil deeds that he does so it's going to be uh it's going to be interesting to watch in the book uh kind of what happens with him Mm -hmm. but the cool thing about my series is uh in spawn you kind of know that you know spawns the main character and hellbringers uh you kind of think lilith is the main character and then you read a little more and you think maybe jengar is the main character and then you're like wait 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 maybe lucifer the conqueror is the main character and then you start to realize wait i don't know who's gonna win at the end of this Right, because you're starting to get a lot of stories Mm -hmm. that are starting to flow into this one big story, and you're like, I'm meeting all these players, and they all have a chance to be the king or queen of hell at the end of this, you know. So, I think that's the intrigue of our story compared to like a spawn story is because in spawn, you know, it's action adventure, it's hero. In our story, you don't know what the hell is going on yet. Would it be would it be accurate would it be accurate to say that the main character, for lack of a better term, is the is the setting of hell it's is the setting of hell itself that you have in hell? I, it's it's incredible that you might be the first person to ever get that, but yes, the uh, the setting itself is hell in Hellbringers. The bringers are the beings that live there. The team itself is called Hellbringers that Lilith is building. Mm-hmm. But the concept of Hellbringers itself is, you know, everybody that's there is kind of a Hellbringer because they're there. Like, and, and, and you know, it even says it as the story starts uh, that, you know, God puts all his unwanted creatures in this specific place. And that specific place is kind of the noun that everything else is referring to after mm-hmm. that. So you're, you're 100% on that. Uh, hell itself is pretty much... The kingdom itself is the main character of the story. Yeah, I I um I bring that kind of thing up in the same way that say, um one of the main characters in a lot of in a lot of noir in a lot of noir settings and to a certain degree some cyberpunk settings, is the is the city itself is as much a character as the characters that inhabit it. I, yeah, totally. Um. Now, one one question that I one question that I often bring up with um, with with comic book creators that I've ha- that I've had on is whether they're whether they were a Marvel or a DC guy. But since you grew up in the '90s, I get the feeling that if it it's it was it's a combination of Marvel and Image. You know, it's uh, it's crazy because now uh, nowadays it's everything. So my my comic knowledge goes back to, you know, when it all started back in the late 1800s, you know what I mean, with the first book. And then, I, and I, you know, what's crazy is I almost owned that book at one time. Uh, there was one copy left like seven years ago, 
and I uh, almost owned it. And I would have loved to have had it in my collection because it was like the first uh, picture storytelling book that was in the comic format. Mm-hmm. But um, the reason it's important is because it's American folklore. Like when it comes to our culture and our society, one of the things that we'll be remembered for in the future years is being able to put out a book that um, told stories via pictures and words at the same time. Mm-hmm. And I'm, 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 I think that's pretty cool that I get to contribute to that. But, uh, you know, my knowledge goes all the way up to the 40s, uh, 50s, 60s, Golden Age, Silver Age, all mm-hmm. the way up. And um, when I was a kid, it felt like it was mostly 80s and 70s, uh, you know, Brown Jay's Marvel stuff that really is all I cared about. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, but image, image I liked, but there was something about the art back then that, um, as a kid kind of turned me off a little bit and it's weird. Cause like now I like it, like it, it's, it's so weird. Like how there were certain things as a kid that I really was gravitated towards, uh, via art and comics that it's changed now that different art, you know, I gravitate towards it a little bit more now. But, uh, you know, one of the ones that I loved and has another influence uh, for Hellbringers mm-hmm. is uh, the Sandman. Mm-hmm. So uh, that one was a DC Comics uh, mm-hmm. book, but I read the hell out of it in the 90s as a mm-hmm. kid. And I got to tell you, if there's one book that probably, you know, influenced me to do Hellbringers more than any, it's got to be Neil Sandman for sure. Although Sandman is is Vertigo, so it's that, so it's DCness is uh, is is not a, is not as clear cut as a lot of people would think. Since the whole purpose of Vertigo was to have stuff that you couldn't do in the DC universe, but still get published un, under the DC umbrella, um, which is why you had a, uh, more out there stuff under that particular label. Um, that's right. They had they had all sorts of stuff coming out back then via Vertigo that was supposed to be more adult. And um, DC actually prints Sandman stuff just under their regular label now. A lot of people don't know this, but uh, Vertigo's kind of gone away. You know what I mean? It got killed off from too many failures over the over the last few years of a bu- of a bunch of, of a bunch of people doing um, what was effectively vanity projects that weren't selling. Right. Um, I, I, one of my fondest memories of, um, of Vert, of Vertigo per se is the, is the, um, Hellblazer, the story that gave us John Constantine, which John Constantine. was, Al, what, what was basically conceived because Alan Moore wanted an excuse to draw Sting. <laughs> <laughs> um, Al, Alan Moore may be an ass, but he's an interesting ass. I'll give him that. <laughs> Right. Oh. You know, I don't judge too many people by their character that are in the uh, public light. And the reason I don't is because um, what they're doing is not the same as who they are. You know what I mean? Oh, he's, so, he's admitted to being an ass. <laughs> right. Right. And here's the thing is like, to me, like reading the book doesn't change anything with mm-hmm. knowing who the person is. You know what I mean? No, I like you, you want to be enthralled in that story. Oh yeah, you know what I mean. Uh, I just, I just sometimes, sometimes, sometimes the personality of the of the creator can be just as just as interesting as the creation itself. Um, That's true. I not too long ago, I I had I had gone through a documentary on the cre- on the creation of Image and and kind of the events that led to that led to it. Um, which was how, which is how I learned that, um, Todd McFarlane has self-described himself as an asshole. Um, <laughs> and he, he, as, he, as well as, a, as well as a lot of the other, a lot of the other, um, image, that first generation of image guys had grown up with these stories about what happened to Jack Kirby and how he, and, how he kind of got screwed over by the by the industry, and we're determined to not have that happen to him, especially Todd. His whole attitude is, "I'm going to screw you before you can screw me." <laughs> um, but 
the apparently the apparently the whole thing went down is they had they had set up a meeting with their with the higher ups and said we're doing it we're doing image it's just a matter of are we doing it image are we working with you to do to do image or are we doing it on our own because if we're doing it on our own we're not working with you um and in the most tone de in the most tone deaf comment possible one of the one of the marvel people at the meeting had said and i quote there's always someone else to pick the cotton <laughs> which is like i said probably the most tone deaf thing you could have said in that situation when you got when you got four guys who are frustrated with a lack of input but it is it is interesting that you br that you bring up Sandman, especially given the heavy and the heavy influence of Mythos within um, within Hellbringers, um, u utilizing different mythologies and dif and different um, motifs that a lot of people associate with fantasy. I think that uh, the fantasy element mm -hmm. is what sets us apart from other books. I think. Uh, that kind of play in the realm of hell. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think there's ever been a um, in a fantasy setting like this in hell, mm -hmm. to where it's uh, setting up to be like a fantasy, you know, story. And I think that's kind of what sets us apart. And I think that is why people are kind of enjoying it, just because they know it's dark, but they also know like they're getting a real story and with a real ending. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And and I think that's the best thing about our books is a lot of times on these Kickstarter books, people will just buy the book for the cover and never open the book at all. And with our books, people are actually reading the insides and telling us how much they love the story. And that's that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to when it comes now when it comes to that particular that particular setting. Um, was, this is a question that I've asked a fair few people, but was it a case where you ended up creating characters first and then built a world around them, or was it the other way around? So, with the card game, we actually had, um, on the card game, we had all the characters first. So, uh, if you, if you haven't had a chance to play the card game, it's, it's a lot of fun. It takes mm -hmm. about 15 minutes. You can play with your buddy. Mm -hmm. And if you lose, you get to be the boss as you face your buddy's team that he is, uh, basically put together to fight you. And it's a fun game. Uh, I play it with my friends a lot. I haven't been beaten yet, which is crazy because, you know, yeah, I wrote the rules, but the rules are there and it's just chance. I mean, cause we play with dice. Mm -hmm. So uh, but all the characters are in that game. We have about 40 characters a piece in each deck. So if you're interested out there, people, and you're thinking, oh, my God, this sounds great. I would like to know more about these characters. Well, the first place you can see the characters is in the card game before. You can uh, read about them in the comics in the years to come. So mm -hmm. you'll kind of get a little heads up uh, knowing what's going to happen. But I do sit there and I think about a little synopsis of the character I, I design him i draw him up and then i'll sit there and i'll i'll make a little story about him and then you know you can you can actually create a comic series just based off that one little story on mm -hmm. the back of these cards you know what i mean so that's that's kind of what i've uh i've started thinking is you know the ones that i really like and i feel that have strong potential to have a series or some kind of story that you can just tell or any kind of story that can fall into a mini series, even mm -hmm. like they're going to get their chance. You know, if I have the money, they're going to get their chance to, to see the big time, to see the comic world. So I, uh, I, I bring life to the card characters via the comics. And I love watching other people draw the, mm -hmm. uh, the character. I am a comic artist myself, but nothing's better than watching somebody else bring your, character to life mm -hmm. now i want to touch on the i want to touch on the card game for a bit um did you have it what prompted the idea of doing a of doing a hellbringers card game did you cut your teeth on on something like magic in the past so 
and this is going to sound crazy, I was never a Magic guy. I never played any Pokemon or uh, Yu-Gi-Oh! ever. And all of a sudden, like, I was sitting in my backyard one day because we have a, we have a friend that prints metal cards. And the person that he prints them for, I mean, you know, he's got an extensive list of clients. Mm-hmm. And one of them is Lady Death. And he has these metal cards that he made for Lady Death for years. Mm-hmm. And I was like, man, these would be cool if we made some of these. And he's like, you should. So we made a metal set of the prototype cards for the first ones. And it was just going to be like, you know, a beautiful art experiment is really what I was trying to make it out to be. I wanted the cards to look like the old Fleer marble cards that I was telling you that inspired me so much back Mm -hmm. in the day where they had stats and stuff on the back. So we kind of went in that direction and, you know, I had them printed. And I threw one up on eBay, and the thing sold out in, like, five minutes. And I just remember, like, like whoa, what just happened? Like, because we don't even have a product yet, you know? Mm-hmm. And about, I think it was, like, two years later, me and my friend, I was, like, I was sitting in the backyard, and I was, like, dude, I know how to make this a game. So I, like, messaged my friend, and I'm, like, hey, like we we can do this like i know we can do this he's like i just figured this out like math wise and i just have i have all these rules written down i'd like to uh i'd like to see if we can you know build uh design for this right Mm -hmm. so uh i had a guy help me uh build the graphic design stuff for it and once we did i was off and rolling man Uh, we didn't get funded for the first set on kickstarter which was a huge disappointment, but at the same time, uh, that's life. So the second set, uh, it wasn't going to stop me. I I went and I put the second set on Kickstarter, and it was funded uh, within the first 30 minutes, which was fantastic. And then uh, we had a third set that came after the the book with Chad Harden for the Sacred Heart, which was awesome. Uh, And then we have a fourth set coming out next year, if we can get it all done, because that card set uh, takes about twice as long as a comic book and mm-hmm. produces about one eighth the money of a comic book. Mm-hmm. So I do it all for fun. I do it just because I love playing the game myself. Uh, and all these characters that come out are fun characters. Like uh, my stepdaughter is in there. My future wife is in there. Uh, I'm in there, believe it or not. I mean, there there are cards that actually have some of our friends in it, and you just wouldn't believe uh, who they are. And uh, the, the artist that actually helped us work on it, like Bob Camp, the creator of Ren and Stimpy, did a card for the first set. Mm-hmm. And like Marat Michaels, Ryan Kincaid, like just amazing, amazing artists that, you know, um, come on here and want to help. The yeah, Rafino, Chad Harden for the second set, Ben mm-hmm. Bishop, who does Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, we get some really big names that help us out a lot. And I'm, I'm super excited to work with all these guys. And working with them actually gave me the confidence to know that I could work with artists for other projects. And those other projects turned out to be the comic books. And once I knew that I could actually make the comic book myself and go to town, dude there was no better feeling in the world to get over that plateau of thinking you can't do it. And then you do it like, and then you continue to do it and get better at it. Like this is a calling for some people, man. And you just, you don't realize you're calling because you think you can't do it. Mm -hmm. And people tell you, you can't do it your whole life. And then you do it. And you're like, man, I can do this. I can show other people that they can do it too. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? Now, one of the one of the other things that um that I had I had picked on very qu- I had picked on very quickly on your on your on your website Silent Mayhem Productions is the, is the fact that you have the you have the you have your own little soundtrack for Hellbringers. How did that come about? Because doing a soundtrack for a count for a comic book meta series is certainly not a is certainly an uncommon phenomena. Yeah. Yeah. I've uh, I've had a couple people like it's it's so funny. Tom Hutchinson from Big Dog Inc was on the show last night, and he um, he was like, "Listen, he's like, out of all the things that I've done, 
He's like, what about you this year? He's like, you put out five books and you have a soundtrack. I don't even have a soundtrack. And I was like, you know, a lot of people don't have soundtracks. That's not something a lot of people would even think to do. Um, Mm -hmm. I actually own the rights to all the music for the uh, soundtrack because I had it all commissioned just the same way I would as doing uh, artist work. And what was really cool is I got to produce all that music too. So Mm -hmm. uh, I had all the different, um, (laughs) I wrote, I wrote two of the songs Mm -hmm. actually. Uh, If, uh, if you have a chance, uh, the ties that bind us by Eric Castiglia, I wrote that one. And then I also wrote uh, the great fire mountain. Mm -hmm. book to the great fire mountain by michael scott i wrote that one as well but uh it's you know it's it's hard man like that that industry that trying to get the music from the guys like trying to get what you want you know having to do changes it's the exact same thing as being a producer in comics uh which i thought was you know kind of cool that you can transition all this over i mean if we wanted to do movies someday it really wouldn't be hard at all because comics are basically storyboards as it is. And then we have music that we can produce. We have sounds that we can produce like just getting into that movie world is going to be something else someday. But at the moment I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm really focusing on our comics and what we can do with them. Um, I really, I, I mean, there's no better feeling in this world then reading your own book, getting it in your hand for the first time. Uh, there's, I'm, I'm telling you, man, like I'm, I'm doing covers for other people, big time publishers. Mm-hmm. And I feel dead inside sometimes when I'm doing them. Like, and I just started, so I shouldn't be like that. I should be very excited, very happy to be doing these. And the truth is, is nothing makes me happier than Hellbringers. Mm-hmm. Nothing. And I never thought it was going to be like that. I thought when I got my big opportunity, I was finally going to be like, oh, my God, yes, this is what I work for forever. I can finally die in peace. But that's not the case at all. Like, it almost feels like you're a ghost and you're walking in a world full of people that don't see you. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? And and that's exactly what it feels like right now uh, with getting the work that I'm getting is I just don't I don't feel excited Uh at all really Mm -hmm. so now when it comes to when it comes to when i came to when i came to the the conception of the of the world that you had set up um a lot of a lot of people when they make when they make um settings of the like they'll end up writing what could be considered a series bible i.e i.e the um rules of the rules of that particular setting the um the major, the major arcs, the major themes, and so and so on, to try and keep everything internally consistent. Um, as you're developing Hellbringers, did you end up writing anything like that? Uh, yeah, we have uh, three, I think, three entire like little notebooks, hundred pages, I believe, mm-hmm. of what I could basically like do in the world. So before we even made the first book, I had written for two years. Uh, basically character stories, backdrop stories, uh, the rules of hell. Like if you die in our setting, you're not fully dead. Basically what happens is that soul floats above your body and that soul will either be eaten by soul reavers or it'll be saved and reattached to the body via the reanimator. So there's, uh, there's, there's things in Hellbringers people haven't seen yet. But if you've played the card game and read the card stories, you know exactly how it works. Mm -hmm. But uh, there is, I mean, you know, you're right, man. There's, there's a little, there's a little story behind the story. There's a little, a Bible would work perfect, actually. I mean, I don't see why I shouldn't write an outline book for Hellbringers because that would be, I mean, that would probably explain a lot for a lot of people. I should probably do that. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with that, with that in mind, what would you say? You've you've put out um, you put out several books within this series by the, by this point. Um, what would you say have been some of the biggest learning experiences in terms of creating your own universe and creating your own um, comic book series like this? Oh God, man! 
That is a great question. Uh, let me let me let me just start by saying this. Uh, you don't know what you're in for working with other people ever, especially people that you don't know. And when it comes to the artist world, you know, there are people out there that are like amazing quality artists that you're never going to have a problem with. And then there's some that are prima donnas. You know what I mean? It's, it's almost like the NFL where you have a star wide receiver or something like that. Mm -hmm. And they get that special preferential treatment. Like that's, that's kind of what it feels like sometimes, but I haven't, I haven't actually run into that problem a lot, my friend, uh, maybe just once or twice. And the reason I'm even uh, bringing it up is because I want people to know out there, it's not all, you know, sunshine and rainbows out here for guys like me uh, as a publisher, because artist wrangling is tough, bro. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. It's, it, it's, it's probably the toughest thing you can do. Like, I've got a guy that has a, uh, a cover due in five days, and I haven't seen a layout for it yet. You know what I mean? So it, that's that's kind of one of those uh, things. But I got to tell you, like, I mean, that being said, there's a lot of good, too. Like, you'll you'll learn from artists how to be professional. Like, dude, I'm a better professional now because of the way um, the way I've, I've learned from different great artists, great, you know, writers, great letterers because I've worked with them and they taught me how to be a better person and a mm -hmm. better, uh, professional. Mm -hmm. And I really needed that. Like I, dude, I was not, I, I mean, I'm going to straight up say it before this year, I was not the most professional artist, not even close. And I didn't even realize it. And you don't, I mean, you, you don't realize it until you start working with people that are unprofessional. And then you start to see like, what you're doing wrong and dude it taught me so much i've grown up so much just because uh i've been doing this mm -hmm. and and <sighs> man where was i going with that <laughs> <laughs> this is this is why this is why i don't extensively plan how how my how my show go, how my show goes down it's just a case of i've got a few ideas and let's just wing the rest because I know, because things will always happen. Right. What was the original question? Um, it had to do mostly with le with um learning experiences when it came when it came okay, to so, the process. So those those were the biggest learning experiences. Were working with all the people that I worked with, but uh, you know, learning about how to make the comic itself, how you want to make the interiors look how your graphic design looks, how you're able to, you know, space words to where they won't be cut off by the printer. Mm -hmm. uh, there's all sorts of stuff that you got to learn and keep learning. And dude, it is an ever evolving process. And there are printers that are going to get your stuff right one day and they're going to completely fuck it up the next day. Uh, and, and that's just life. And, you know, the problem is, is you can create and you can right and you can have the best art or the best covers in the world and at the end of the day you've done everything right and you're set and you shouldn't be worried about anything and then all of a sudden you lose communication with your printer for a week mm -hmm. you know what i mean and this this is the kind of shit that happens that just drives you crazy as a publisher and the biggest learning experience that you can take away from that is this is supposed to be fun uh this is not fun this is a job so the quicker you can get this out of your head that you're doing this for fun and that you're doing this, you know, as a job, your means of living, mm -hmm. then the better off you'll be uh, as far as, you know, what my learning experience has been. It's that not only that, but um, as far as, you know, me showing showing off who I am as a cover artist, that's basically dead. Like I show off everyone else now. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because the truth is, is when I spend money on those people, they're an investment for me. And and when I spend money on those people, I want to build them to make sure I sell them. Otherwise, if I'm just selling my books, why the fuck did I hire these other people? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, and, and, you know, my books, if I sell my books, it's just a free, it's just a free meal is the best way I like to say it. Cause I'm the one doing it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So that's, that's the other thing is, I've, I've become a 
an advocate of other people and and and, you know you don't you don't realize how cutthroat this industry is with other people trying to screw over other people not trying to get work and it's happened to me several times from other artists that i will not name but the the reason you bring it up is because you know you should have that same attitude that other people have but you just don't and and i don't man like i i would rather have all the people that work with me succeed than me ever have anything uh you know out there like a like a cover from the top three or something like that i'd rather have everybody else that worked with me get that because that makes me look good Mm -hmm. all these people that have come and done interiors for me have gotten amazing jobs afterwards like uh cory hampshire did uh snake eyes right after he worked with me uh let's see rich bonk is doing uh dark horse nexus right now which is amazing I mean, and, and it doesn't stop. Ed Smith is uh, working with, uh, God, who are they? Um, God. Slipping my mind right now. But uh, he's working with a major publisher as well. And mm-hmm. I'm just saying, all the people that, you know, gave us a chance, like Joseph Michael Linsner, uh, you know, I mean, all, I mean, they just looked at me and they were like, you know, who are you? And instead of being like, who are you? Fuck you. Get out of here. They were like, who are you? Let's make an awesome comic and let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And the worst thing that people can do is say no. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, or, and, and, and people don't get that. Like people think it's going to be a big thing. They walk up, talk to them, try to get work, try to get them to do work for you. No, 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 man. Here's the thing. The worst thing somebody can do is say no. And no does not feel that bad when they say it. Because trust me, I have had more artists tell me no than tell me yes. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it never changes. The feeling never goes away of that rejection. But, you know, as far as the industry goes, you're going to get rejected all the time. For, for almost anything. Not just artists, you know, not wanting to do your project. But... Let's say you're an artist and you're trying to get on other people's projects. I have been denied like at least 95% of the time. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like that 5% of the time is the work that I've got. And yeah, it's good work. Like I have a Vampirilla cover, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? That just came out or is coming out. And and the reason I bring that up is because that's part of that 5% that you work so goddamn hard for. Because that 95% of rejection and heartache and pain is mm-hmm. worth the 5% that you get to actually live in the industry for a moment. Because this, this industry doesn't need you. It doesn't need me. It doesn't need anybody else to survive. The truth is, is it's going to survive no matter what without anybody. It's what do you leave on the industry while you're in it? Mm-hmm. Because you're not bigger than the industry. The industry will always be bigger than you, no matter who you are, you know? So, I mean, there were other comics before Stan Lee, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's how you have to look at this is, you know, we take Stan Lee out of the equation. Sure. We don't have the same quality of comics that we have now. Okay. The dude did a lot. The reason I bring him up is because if we don't have him, we still have comic books though. So the genre and the the industry still exist. They live. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And, and nowadays, these independent comic books, guys like me, guys like Ni- Niobe Comics, uh, Tom Hutchinson out there at Big Dog Inc., Lady Death with Brian Polito, who's just murdering it right now. Uh, you know, these guys are the future of comic books because they have stories. They have characters people are invested in. They don't have to go through Diamond to set this up. They don't have to go through Marvel. Mm-hmm. You know, the powers that be aren't always the best at picking what's good for you as a fan. And what whatever content that you want, that you seek out, that is new and great, and you want to read it, and it actually makes you happy to read, mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's with these new books, these new indie creators, the guys that are putting their hearts and soul out there where everybody else told them no, like Image. To where they couldn't make their own book with those guys because it wasn't good enough. It wasn't going to sell. Now they get to go out and sell it them goddamn selves, make all the money, get all the glory, 
with their own production label. And, and you know, the image guys kind of paved the way for that. But there's a new revolution happening right now. And that revolution is creators making their own creations mm-hmm. without giving a fuck what anybody else says. And it's it's very interesting that you bring that you bring that up because, well, it's it's something that I've no, I've been noticing, slowly slowly bi- slowly bi- build momentum like a snowball down a hill, and it's just get it's just getting larger and larger with t- with time. And I think the sheer vo- the sheer volume of ho- of the hall that I had when I met you at Ca- when I met you at Cowtown and a bunch of others at um, Cowtown um, speaks volumes because that because that's far from an isolated case. Correct. Uh, I, I think that all the people out there, when you go to a comic shop or, you know, you go to a comic convention, you can see all the pretty variants by all the pretty artists. Mm-hmm. But if you're looking for something that you actually want to read, stay the fuck away from Marvel and DC. <laughs> Just do it. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, guys. I'd love to work for them someday, and their characters are great, but... The simple fact of the matter is, is, you know, it's the flavor of the week. Who's this? Who's that? What's their status? Who cares? What's the story? Here's the thing. When it comes to, you know, a character, character development is a big deal. But you also want to build a character, you know, for an audience to last, you know, a long time. You don't want it just to be a flash in the pan. Or, you know, why did you do it? Why did you take so long to build a character for one issue when he dies tomorrow? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Or how many times does a character have to die in Marvel before they are actually dead? You know what I mean? Like, I'm so tired of seeing Wolverine die, come back, die, come back, die, come back. How many times do I have to see this shit? And why do I care? How many first issues do I have to buy? You know what I mean? of a series before I can actually read the rest of the series and care about it. As a collector, I gave up. Mm -hmm. I can't keep up with first issues. I can't keep up with key appearances. And I can't keep up with the fact that Marvel and DC has become self-aware that these are the ones that, you know, make money. So they'll go out with retail covers and stuff like that and just, you know, charge a fortune for these covers. And people never read the inside of the book. They're just buying them for the expensive cover that they can think they can sell later on for more money. This is not the industry that I got into. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I didn't get into this for that. And as a collector, I do realize that, you know, and even, even Hellbringers books, if you look on eBay, I realize they sell for a ton of money. And a lot of people don't understand. That's not me making those sales. Those are other people. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that's the collector's market. But, the reason I bring it up is because we have a story inside worth reading, in my opinion. And it's not just because I wrote it. It's because, you know, I wanted to write something that people would open the book, read it, and be like, I want to know what happens next. I want to read it next week. If there was a book coming out next month, I would pick it up at my local comic shop if I could. Mm-hmm. That's what I wanted to do. I did not want to ever have it to where we would have expensive covers and that would be the only reason people would buy the book. Mm-hmm. But that being said, man, we have expensive covers. You know what I mean? The same way that Marvel and DC do it. I mean, the same way they're making those retail sales. You know, we're kind of doing the same thing with uh, Hellbringers covers. But, you know, we don't have huge markups or anything like that. But we try to keep it around the, the usual $20 mark for a Kickstarter book like most people do for a regular trade issue. Uh, it just so happens that we have, you know, top quality artists from Marvel and DC working with us that uh, we couldn't be prouder of to work with, you know. Mm-hmm. But a lot of these people from Marvel and DC are working with us. And, I mean, we we pay better. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. That's just that's just what it comes down to in the, in the, in the end. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I'll so- I will certainly, um, I will certainly be, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how that, how that kind of thing develops and how um, how Hellbringers um, develops. And um, with with all of, with all of that in mind, 
Um, I know th I know that um, the trade paperback version of the first arc is uh, is on its final stretch on Kickstarter, and congratulations for smashing your initial goal since you were asking for um, for only five hundred dollars and you're at two thousand and change. I really appreciate it. Um, we'd have a little bit more if it wasn't for the fact that I got banned from Facebook for thirty days, so I'm still pissed off about that. Well, well, look at it. Look at it like this it. way. Look at it this way. On the next Kickstarter, you can, you can, um, you can, you can, ad you can advertise it as the book Facebook doesn't want you to read. <laughs> that's, that's a good point. It's it's a book a lot of people don't want you to read. I'm surprised they haven't been assassinated yet. If you want to know the truth. Oh, <laughs> uh, I think I think it's because I think it's because of the fact that th that they're um they're. They're swamped under the under the weight of all the paperwork. Maybe they're fans. <laughs> well, there, there's that. There's that. Too, there's that too. But there's so there's so many there's wait there's so many comic creators in the indie scene who aren't um who aren't to, who aren't towing who aren't towing the big two's line that um that it that's a case of okay who, okay who do we take out to stop this movement um. Do we have to take? Do we have to pick one? <laughs> well, that's that's the thing is I've been noticing uh, there's indie creators out there um, that I, I get a little worried about, like thinking maybe they're gonna try to take us out sometime because if they undercut us and they uh, take us out, then their market grows a little bit better mm -hmm. because everybody's fighting over the same piece of pie in the indie community. You know, it's like one or two percent of the market. And so for that one or two percent of the market, you got like 20 to 30 people, you know, vying for a little piece of the pie every time. And the same fans are usually the ones backing it. I like and to so, I like to think I, that um, that it's a it's a case of um, se of second strike, i.e. a lot of a lot of them. There's obvious there's obviously exceptions, but a lot of them wouldn't try and do that, do that kind of undercutting because they because the the risk of re the risk of retaliation or the or the fact that um, undercutting somebody might get might get someone else mad and the do and the domino effect goes out from there <laughs> especially well, given how so many people know each other that's the thing is everybody knows everybody so mm -hmm. everybody knows everything and so like in the industry like people don't realize how small it is and, you know, they think they can get away with almost anything. Well, you know, there's one creator out there that basically won't send people comps, you know, until eight months past, you know, them being due or when they said they were going to have them. And, you know, instead of, you know, being nice, just messaging, letting you know, they just let it go, man, and act like, you know, you're never going to get those books. And then when you say something, they try to bury you. And mm -hmm. so I've actually had that happen to me. And now I've got two other people that have come forward and told me that, you know, the same things happened to them. And I'm mm -hmm. just like, Jesus, man. Like, and if, if people knew like some of the stuff about, you know, others that we just don't tell people, you know what I mean? Because it's unprofessional for me to open my mouth and start blabbing about somebody like you're not going to hear a name right now. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And the reason for that is because I wouldn't want anybody to do that to me, even though, I would never have a reason for him to do it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But the the thing is, is just kind of unprofessional for, you know, a publisher to badmouth another publisher, even if I was an artist during the time that this happened. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's good guys out there and there's bad guys out there. And the fans are pretty good about knowing who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. They can tell the ones that are trying to make the best product for them. Mm -hmm. Um Every Kickstarter we do, I run a stretch goal where people get a... The first stretch goal is a, a, a card from the card game. Because I, I want you to get it and be like, oh my god, what's this? This is neat. You know what I mean? But, you know, those cards are not cheap. And, you know, all the stuff that we give away is not cheap. And shipping at the moment is a little bit more than what we even advertise to, for people to pay. And... You know, one of the things about me is, you know, I, I'm good at selling stuff. I'm a good businessman. But at the end of the day, I'm not the best businessman. Because mm -hmm. I care more about what people think about the book and making it good and making it quality, 
not just from the printing uh, aspect, from the thickness of the pages, but all the way up until, you know, the line details for the interior artist. Mm -hmm. Like, like we, we care so much at Silent Mayhem Productions about what the book is going to be forever remembered as, you know, because when all these Kickstarters are all said and done at the end of the day, and all we have is our books left and it's not a popularity contest anymore. I guarantee you my books are going to rise above a lot of the others as far as quality. And the reason for that is because of how much time, effort and soul that we put into them compared to other people that are only in it for a cash grab. And we're not, mm -hmm. you know, all we care about is what you think about us. And even at the end of the day, when we were acting cool, we should be like, ah, who gives a fuck what you think? That's not the truth at all. Mm -hmm. We love the fans. We love the customers. We love all the people that read Hellbringers, Jengar, Hellpog and Velocicock. I mean, you guys are the reasons that we put the books out that I continue to go every day, that I'm up at 3 a.m. in the morning thinking at night um, while working all day, shipping or drawing or writing. Like at the moment, did mm -hmm. four covers, a commission, and three scripts this week. Three scripts, ladies and gentlemen, is something that usually takes me about two months. Like, I just don't have a choice. I got to write it right now. And, mm -hmm. and man, I wouldn't do this at all if people didn't like it. I wouldn't do it if, if you know, I didn't like it, if I didn't feel like I could give it 100%. I, the moment I feel like I, I'm not giving it a hundred percent anymore is the moment I'm going to just give it up. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, and I hope that people see it in the book. I hope they know that I'm putting my life on the line by even making the book. And if you read the book, you'll understand why. Like I, it's a story. It's just a story, but who else is going to tell it? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But yeah. Go ahead. And I'll I will cer I will certainly be looking forward to what store what stories come along as t as time goes on. But with all with all of that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking th taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. Thanks for having me. And. Anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to discuss Hellbringers or to, to or to talk about how talk about how the um, how the how even in even in your own card game, RNG Jesus does not save. <laughs> the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And of, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>